and Training Series, sponsored by the Office of Capacity Development and Applied Prevention Science and the Office of Community Health and Hazard Assessment. I'm David Millard, the Associate Director of Science for OCDAPS. Before we start, I have a couple of housekeeping items. First, this webinar is recorded and we plan to release the recording to the public. So the attendees are muted during the presentation. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, we will answer your questions. And after that, if we have time, we will go to live Q&A. Today's training will cover the newest version of the shower model. We're on a two year schedule with releasing the model with the version one being released in 2018, version two released in 2020, and now version three. I'd like to take a moment to mention the members of the shower model team. Some have been with the team from the beginning and others have joined along the way. Here's the team members, Karen Scruton, Emery De Pasquale, Tariq Ahmed from New Jersey, Teresa Foster, Andy Dudley, Tanya Burke, and Jason Sautner, our newest member. We are supported by Will Morgan with Eastern Research Group, who has a major role in the shower model's success. While today's training focuses on the new features and outputs in version three, we will have another training planned for June 22nd. In that training, we will show you how to import the shower model results into FAST to calculate hazard quotients and cancer risk. Now here's Will. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fourth webinar in ATSDR's public health training series. So my name is Will Morgan, like David said. I work for ERG, a contractor for ATSDR. Today we'll be talking about ATSDR's shower and household water use exposure model, or the ATSDR shower model for short. I'll give you a brief overview of the program and then demonstrate how to use the newest version of the shower model, version 3.0. So some of you may be asking, what is the shower model? Shower stands for the shower and household water use exposure model. It's a desktop application for evaluating inhalation and dermal exposures to contaminants from indoor household water use. The program simulates chemicals volatilizing from water into indoor air each time water passes through an appliance. It includes most common household appliances such as showers, bathtubs, toilets, sinks, dishwashers, and clothes washers. Model tracks each time an appliance is used by any person in a house. So every time somebody takes a shower or a bath, the program simulates the chemical mass released into the air from the water used in the shower or bath. And it does the same thing anytime someone uses the toilet, a kitchen sink, a bathroom sink, or any other water using appliance in the model. Based on the chemical mass released from water in each of these appliances, the program calculates an average daily inhalation exposure concentration for each person in the house according to where they are in the house throughout the day. The concentration includes time spent in the shower bathing and time spent elsewhere in the house. And for site-specific scenarios, it can account for time that people spend outside of the home. The program also calculates dermal exposures for each person in the house from how often they use the shower, the bathtub, and the sinks. So ATSDR has released three versions of the shower model. Version one came out in May of 2018 included a default scenario and 14 additional standard scenarios for simulation, but didn't allow users to customize any of the model parameters. ATSDR introduced parameter customization options in version two, which was released in February, 2020. Version two allowed users to customize most of the model parameters to simulate site-specific scenarios in houses with one to eight people and one or two bathrooms. Then ATSDR released version three of the shower model in May, 2022. It includes a few major enhancements, which I'll go over on the next slide. The biggest enhancement to version three of the shower model is actually an enhancement associated with ATSDR's public health assessment site tool, or FAST. With version three, health assessors can now export a file with concentrations and doses calculated from the shower model and import data into FAST. Once the data are loaded into FAST, users can calculate hazard quotients and cancer risks using a new shower model exposure calculator built into FAST version 2.1. Today's training will just go over how to run version three of the shower model and how to export the results from the shower model to a file for import into FAST. 
We'll go over how to import the file into FAST and use the FAST shower model exposure calculator in another training in a few weeks. Another enhancement to the program is the inclusion of central tendency exposure and reasonable maximum exposure scenarios in the shower model default simulation. Previously, the default scenario was a single scenario run that used central tendency values for most model parameters, along with a few conservatively selected parameters to better protect health. While developing shower model version three, ATSDR used Monte Carlo simu simulations to better characterize the default scenario and found that even with the conservatively selected parameters, the scenario produced central tendency estimates that did not capture upper bound exposures. So ATSDR used the results of the Monte Carlo simulations to develop actual CT and RME scenarios and update the, the default simulation to report those instead. We also added a term to the shower model governing equations that accounts for the effect of contaminant saturation in air. The term reflects the fact that a contaminant released into the air will slow down as the air becomes more saturated with the contaminant up until a point where the air is fully saturated and the contaminant release rate in the model equations goes to zero. Previous versions of the model did not account for this process, but version three does. Some other updates that we won't get into too much detail today include the addition of 14 new PFAS for simulation in the model. The program now includes 17 total, of which only two are volatile. Some of these PFAS have health guidelines and others do not. But nevertheless, they're included in the shower model so health assessors can see the magnitude of their contribution to the inhalation and dermal pathways. The final major enhancement listed here is the development of new showering comparison values from the shower model. The showering CVs let health assessors screen water concentrations for inhalation and dermal exposures without running the shower model. They're currently available as a downloadable file in FAST version 2.1, and we'll be adding them to the CV screening tool in FAST in a future release. So for more information on the shower model, there are a few different sources you can turn to. The shower model user's guide provides instructions on using the shower model application. The shower model technical document provides background information about the math and science underlining the model. And the shower model exposure dose guide and document provides information for health assessors that explains the results from the model. All of these resources and many other ones are available on the FAST resources page under the shower model guidance and resources heading. If you have questions or comments on anything related to the program, you can email showermodel at cdc.gov for more info. So now let's go ahead and look at how to use the program and generate results. I'm going to switch over from the presentation slides and bring up the shower model application, which I already have open on my computer. The first screen that you'll see after opening the program is the shower model home screen. It contains introductory text that explains the overall purpose and use of the shower model and provides the shower model at cdc.gov email address that you use to submit questions and comments. On this screen, you have the option of clicking the run new scenario button to begin a new scenario or clicking the open existing scenario button to load an existing scenario. Clicking on the open existing scenario button opens up a menu where you can navigate to a previously saved file to open it. Shower model scenario files are all saved with the extension .shower model. So you can, so the program will be looking for those when you click the open existing scenario button. The third button on the screen is the resources button. Clicking the resources button opens a list of reference documents that might be helpful in understanding and applying the model, such as the shower model technical document and instructions on using model results. None of these resources are saved within the shower model application, but you can access them on the FAST resources page, or you can request them by email from showermodel at cdc.gov. Clicking on the home button takes you back to the home page. From here, let's go ahead and click the run new scenario button to start entering data for a new scenario. When you run a new scenario, the first screen you'll see is the site information screen. At the top of the screen, you'll see the progress bar, which lists the program's seven data entry screens. The progress bar lets you know which screen you're on, which screens you have opened, and which screens you have yet to visit. The progress bar colors all have different meanings. So like blue, like the current color of the site information screen indicates the current screen. A dark blue color, like the shade you see for the buttons here at the bottom of the program, indicates a visited screen. And gray, shown here for the remaining six screens, indicates screens that have not yet been visited. 
As you finish entering information into a screen, the progress bar will display a green check next to the screen title to indicate that the screen is complete. The lack of a green check, like for the site information screen right now, indicates that a screen is incomplete, and a red circle with an exclamation point indicates that the screen has an error. You'll see the progress bar update as we navigate through the screens during this demo. You can navigate back to any screen you have already visited by clicking on the dark blue area in the progress bar associated with the screen. When a screen contains an error, you can return to screens you had visited, but you cannot navigate to the next screen, save your data, or run a simulation until the error is resolved. So in addition to the progress bar, each data entry screen contains two rows of navigation buttons at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to start with the buttons here along the bottom row. These buttons will always be visible no matter what screen you're on in the program. So the home button takes you back to the program home screen, which we looked at earlier. Going back to the home screen will remove any unsaved data, so be sure to save your scenario before pressing the home button. The help button offers information on required fields and other guidance specific to the screen that you're viewing. For example, on this screen, clicking the help button brings up a pop-up that tells you which fields are required. It says here that all fields on this screen except the site name field are optional, so we need to fill out the site name field on the screen to move on to the simulation type screen. The notes button lets you enter notes that are visible from all screens and are exported in the model report. You can use these notes to track anything of interest to you as you're working through the program. The save button allows you to save your scenario as a .shower model file so you can come back to it later. The save button will always prompt you for a file location before saving. Then the run scenario button runs the scenario using the parameter values you have entered. This button stays grayed out until you've entered all the required parameters for the scenario type you're running. You'll pick the scenario type on the program simulation type screen coming up next. If you pick a default scenario, the button will say run default scenario as it does here. If you select a custom scenario, the program, the button will say run custom scenario. So that's all the buttons on the bottom row. The row right above it will have different buttons depending on where you are in the program. The only button currently shown on this screen is clear all, which is inactive because we haven't entered any data yet. On the left side, each screen will have a button that says either clear all or reset to default values. By type of site name, of site A into the site name field on the screen, the clear all button will activate. Pressing the clear all button will bring up a pop-up confirming if you want to clear out all the data. I'm going to click do not clear all though in the pop-up so we can keep the site name we just entered. You'll see on later screens that some screens load with values already entered in some of the fields. If a new scenario screen loads with data already entered, clear all button will read reset to default values instead of clear all. Clicking it will reset the fields on the screen to their default ra values rather than clearing out all the data. On most screens, the back and next buttons will also appear on this row. The site information screen doesn't contain a back button because you can't navigate back to an earlier screen from this tab, but you'll see it on other screens as we move forward. These buttons will disappear when you cannot proceed backward or forward to another data entry screen from the screen you're on either because data are missing or because there's an error. For example, if I delete site A from the site name field, the next button disappears because the site name field is required. Typing it back in makes the next button reappear. You must click the next button to visit each new screen for the first time. On this screen, the site name field is the only required field, so you can proceed to the next screen as soon as you enter a site name. If you have other address information for your site, you can enter that in the other fields on the screen. But since we have a site name entered, we're ready to move on to the simulation type screen. On the simulation type screen, you can see that the back button appear in the bottom navigation rows, and that the clear of all button has changed to say reset to default values. On this screen, you only have one thing to pick, and that's whether you're going to run a default scenario or a custom scenario. The shower model's default scenario is an RME scenario for a four-person household in which everyone takes morning showers. If you run a default scenario, the program also runs a CTE scenario for a four-person household and CTE and RME scenarios for households with one to three people for extra information. 
You'll see how the program provides results for all of these scenarios when we get to the model reports. If you have site information for the site you're looking at, you can also decide to run a custom scenario by clicking the Run Custom Scenario Radio button. If you click the Run Custom Scenario Radio button, the Run Scenario button at the bottom of the screen will switch to say Run Custom Scenario, as it does here. For now, though, let's go back to a default scenario and go on to the Chemical Information screen. The chemical information screen is where you select the chemical in your scenario and where you enter the concentration of the chemical in household water and outdoor air. You select a chemical by typing either its name or its chemical abstract service registry number into the chemical name field at the top of the screen. The program will search for the chemical in the program's database using one of three methods. If you select the begins with radio button, which is already selected here, it will search the database for any chemical or cast number that begins with characters entered in the field. So for example, if you type in BEN for benzene, it will bring up every chemical that begins with the letters BEN. When you see your chemical of interest in the list, click it once to select it. The chemical cast number and synonyms will appear beneath the chemical name field, along with the exposure routes that can be analyzed for the chemical within the program. Exposure route options available within the program are inhalation only, dermal only, or as you see here, inhalation and dermal. You can also type in chemical synonyms and the program will identify the chemical if the synonym is included in the database. For example, typing in PCE will bring up the record for tetrachloroethylene. Standard name for the chemical will appear in the chemical name field after you make your selection. So two other options are also available to search for contaminants. One is the contains button, which returns any entries in the database that contain the text you typed into the chemical name field. And the other is the exact match button, which returns any database entries that exactly match the text you typed. So one other thing you may have noticed on this screen are the blue circles with the letter I in them next to a few of the field titles on the screen. These are information icons that give you useful information for filling out each field when you click them. For example, when I click the information icon next to the chemical name field, it provides information about how to select a chemical. For default scenarios, the edit properties and add chemical buttons will be grayed out. You can't modify chemical properties for the default scenario and you can't add a custom chemical. Those options are available only if you're running a custom scenario. So once you've selected your chemical, as we've done here, the next step is to identify the contaminant concentration in water and outdoor air. You can use the drop downs to change the units associated with either the water concentration or the outdoor air concentration. The program makes you fill in the concentration in water field, but it assumes an outdoor air concentration of zero unless you provide a different number. To enter a concentration, select the field and type a number in. Program accepts regular numbers and numbers formatted using E notation. So, for example, you can enter a water concentration of 100 micrograms per liter using either regular, enough, regular numbers or you can type in 1E2 to represent 100 using E notation. If you enter something that's not a number into either field, as I just did a few times, the program shows a red error message and will not let you proceed to another screen until you resolve the error. For example, typing a letter that's not E into the water concentration field returns an error. The text in the error message will tell you what you need to do to resolve it. In this case, we need to remove the letter we just typed in and make sure the entered text is a number greater than zero. You'll notice that the preview default scenario results button and the run default scenario buttons both activate after you type a number into the concentration and water field. Clicking the preview default scenario results button brings up a pop up showing the average daily exposure concentration for the most highly exposed person in the default scenario. See here that it gives you results in units of micrograms per cubic meter and parts per billion to assist with selecting units for your output report. For example, for PCE at a water concentration of 100 micrograms per liter, running the default scenario returns an average daily exposure concentration of 72 micrograms per cubic meter or 11 parts per billion. 
pressing the X button at the top right of the window closes the preview window. For the, the full report generated by the shower model will display results in either micrograms per cubic meter or parts per billion. So you can use the report units radio button to select the air concentration units you want in the output report. I'll leave micrograms per cubic meter selected for now. After you filled out all the fields on this screen, you're ready to run the model report. Clicking the run default scenario program button will cause the scenario to run. You'll see a progress bar appear as the program proceeds with calculations. And when it's finished, it will take you to the results screen. So when the report finishes loading, you'll see a screen similar to the one shown for your scenario. The header at the top of the report lists the type of scenario. You can see here that we ran a default scenario. The custom scenarios will have different text. The report itself is the scrollable content in the middle of the screen, and at the bottom are a new set of navigation buttons. I'm not going to press any of these buttons now because they all take a while to run, but you can test them out later on your own. The back button here takes you back to the previous screen you ran the simulation from. In this case, it would take us back to the chemical information screen because we pressed the run default scenario button on that screen to run the simulation. The export raw data button generates Excel files showing the minute by minute concentration data calculated using the sim during the simulation. For default scenario simulation, you'll get one Excel file for the default scenario. You also get another seven Excel files for the other CTE and RME scenarios provided for additional information. In a custom scenario, you'll get just one file for the scenario that you ran. The export Word button generates a report in Word of the results for your scenario. It contains the same information that we're about to look at on the results screen. Portions of the report, like tables S1 and S2, should be included in your health assessment documents, but you don't need to include the entire report in your document. The export to FAST button generates a file with the extension .shower model fast export that can be imported into FAST version 2.1 for analysis. We'll go over how to use these files during a later training. The save button is the same save button we looked at before and allows you to save your run as a dot shower model file, which you can reload in the model later. You can use the scroll bar at the right of the screen to scroll through report. Through the report, the report contains text and tables showing the results for your scenario and information about the input parameters the model used. The site and model input information table here at the start of the report gives basic information about the scenario you ran, the contaminant you examined, and the contaminant's concentration in water and air. Scrolling down, after that comes text explaining the contents of the report, along with a text box explaining what the report means when it refers to a target person. Briefly, each report provides results for one person in the scenario. In the default scenario, the target person is the last person to shower in the, in the morning because that person is the most highly exposed person in the scenario. The target person will always be the most highly exposed person when you run a default scenario. In a custom scenario, you can select a different person as the target person. Next comes the primary results section, which has the information you'll need to make health determinations. Table S1 shown here, provides the RME daily exposure concentration for the target person in the default scenario. And table S2 provides the average RME daily administered dermal dose from contact with water for the target person in the default scenario. The dermal doses are exposure group specific and depend on age specific factors. The inhalation concentration, however, is not. It applies to all exposure groups. After the primary results section is the secondary results section. The secondary results section has the results for the supporting scenarios run along with the default scenario. Remember that the default scenario is an RME scenario for a four-person household. The supporting scenarios are a CTE scenario for a four-person household and RME and CTE scenarios for the one, two, and three-person households. Table S3 gives the daily air exposure concentrations for these scenarios and Table S4 gives the daily administered dermal doses. Results for the RME four-person household default scenario are highlighted in yellow in each table. So here's table S3, then table S4.
After these tables, the default shower model report includes text about running custom scenarios, exporting results to FAST, and additional resources related to the shower model. Won't spend any time on this text now, but you can come back and read it later. The next section provides detailed results for the default four-person scenario but beyond those provided in tables S1 and S2. These results are additional information that may be useful in evaluating exposure. Table one shows the RME daily exposure concentration for each person in the four-person household and identifies the target person with an X in the target person column. It also identifies when each person in the four-person household takes their morning shower. Table two shows the dermal doses from contact with water for the target person. The dermal doses in this table are the same as those in table S2. Where table two is different from table S2 is that table two also shows the inhaled dose in micrograms per kilogram per day, which is derived from the RME daily exposure concentration for the most highly exposed person in table one. The inhaled dose is used only for certain chemicals and only when people are showering and drinking the water. You can find more information about when to combine the inhaled dose with dermal and drinking water doses in the shower model guidance document. Tables three and four show information about the target person's inhalation exposure based on their location throughout the day. Table three shows the average air concentrations that the target person experiences while they're taking a shower, while they're in the bathroom afterward, and while they're in the house the rest of the day. And then table four shows the percent of exposure that the target person experiences in each location. Four-person household results figure section provides two figures showing chemical air concentrations within the house throughout the day. In the default scenario, the shower model simulates a house that consists of three compartments, a shower stall, a bathroom, and the main house. Figure one shows the chemical air concentrations in the shower, the bathroom, and the main house compartments throughout the day for the default scenario. You can see here where concentrations rise in the shower compartment when the four people taking when the four people in the household are taking their morning showers, then the air concentrations steadily fall throughout the day. The bathroom and the main house concentrations both increase at different times throughout the day as people use the restrooms and use other appliances, such as the dishwasher or clothes washer. Figure two shows the contaminant air concentrations that the target person is exposed to as they move between compartments throughout the day. Note that figures one and figure two use a log scale for the concentration y-axis so that you can better see the small variation in main house concentrations throughout the day. After the figures, there's a short references section and then tables identifying the model parameters used in the scenario. Table five shown here shows the chemical properties. Table six shows the parameters associated with calculating inhalation and dermal doses for ATSDR standard exposure groups. Table seven shows parameters associated with the house layout and size. Table eight shows the appliance parameters. Table nine shows the clothes washer and dishwasher use schedule. Table 10 shows the timing and duration of showers and bathroom stays for each person in the house. And table 11 shows a few other daily activity parameters not covered in other tables. Table 11 is the last table in the default scenario report. So at this point, this is the end of the default scenario report. Next, I'd like to show you how to enter data for a custom scenario. I'm gonna click the back button, which will take me back to the chemical information screen. From the chemical information screen, we need to navigate back to the scenario type screen to select a custom scenario run. You can either press the back button or click on the simulation type header in the navigation bar to return to the simulation type screen. I'll go ahead and click the simulation type header. 
On the simulation type screen, click the run custom scenario radio button option. You'll see that the run default scenario button at the bottom of the screen changes to a run custom scenario button, which is now grayed out. It will stay inactive until we've entered enough information to run a custom scenario. You'll click on the next button or the chemical information header to go to the chemical information screen. The chemical information screen will load with the chemical data we entered previously. However, this time you'll notice that the edit properties button and the add chemical button are active. Because this is a custom scenario, we can edit the chemicals properties if we want to. If a chemical is not in the database, we can also add an all new chemical. Clicking on the edit properties button brings up a dialog box for editing the chemical data. Here you can see all the chemical parameters that the model uses for tetrachloroethylene. The first four parameters are required for each chemical. To evaluate inhalation exposure, at least one of the chemical F values and the contaminant's Henry's law constant must be greater than zero. And to evaluate dermal exposure, all three dermal parameters need to be greater than zero. Clicking the cancel button will close the screen without saving any changes and clicking reset will restore the parameters to their default values included with the program. Clicking the save button will save any changes you made for use within your custom scenario. Note that clicking save doesn't change the default properties for the chemical, but it does apply any edits that you made to your custom scenario. You can also close out of the screen by clicking the X button at the top of the dialog box. If you click the add chemical button, the same screen will appear, except that all of the fields will be empty or have default values shown. If you click on the preview default scenario results button, it'll still show you results for the default scenario, even though you selected a custom scenario on the simulation type screen. Any changes you've made to the chemical properties won't be reflected in the preview results. For now, let's keep everything as is and go on to the household scenarios screen. The household scenario screen is where you select a standard scenario that will form the basis of your custom scenario. Changes made on this screen affect the parameter values on the next three screens, the house information screen, the appliance parameter screen, and the activity pattern screen. You need to select three things on this screen. The first is the number of persons, the household. The SHAR model lets you simulate houses with one to eight people. So let's, let's select a household with seven people for this example. After selecting the number of persons in the household from the drop down list, you'll see radio buttons for four standard scenario options. Whichever scenario you select will form the basis of your custom scenario, but you'll be able to edit parameters for it in the next three screens. The scenario at the top of the standard scenarios options is selected by default, but you can choose any of them. You'll see here that the shower model lets you simulate scenarios where people are taking tub baths in addition to just showers. If you want to know more about the parameters in a particular scenario, you can click the view default parameter values link to download a Word file that displays the standard parameter settings for whichever scenario you currently have selected. Also, you'll notice that after we selected the number of people in the house, the run custom scenario button activated at the bottom of the screen. If you want to use the standard values associated with the scenarios you selected, you can go ahead and run the custom scenario from this screen. Otherwise, you can go through the remaining screens to change in parameters for the scenario. The other two options you'll need to review on the screen are whether the exhaust fans are on or off when the bathrooms are occupied, and whether the bathroom doors are opened or closed when the bathrooms are occupied. Both options are set to default values, but you can change them if needed. The shower model also gives you the option to enter custom exposure groups on this screen. The shower model provides results for ATSDR's nine standard exposure groups in all scenarios, but you can add up to two additional exposure groups in custom scenarios. You can click the Add Additional Exposure Group button to bring up the Exposure Group dialog. In the dialog box that appears, you'll need to enter a name for the exposure group and all the parameters that the model requires for new groups. The Save button on the dialog will activate after you've filled in all the fields. For now, though, let's stick with the standard groups and close out of this window by pressing the cancel button that goes back to the exposure group screen. One other thing to note about this screen is that pressing the clear all button will reset all the data on the screen and all the values on the next three screens. So only clear the data on the screen if you're sure that you don't need any custom information you entered on the next three screens. 
At this point, we've looked at all the household scenario options. So let's go on to the next screen so you can see more custom options available for the scenario you selected. We won't go over this today, but for more information on how the shower model uses all the parameters we're about to discuss, you can look at the shower model technical document available on the FAST resources page. Go ahead and click the next button to move on to the house information screen. So the house information screen allows you to customize parameters related to the size and layout of the house in your scenario. The screen loads with the default values entered for the scenario you chose on the previous screen. Starting from the top of the screen, you can select the number of bathrooms in the house. The shower model gives you the option of selecting one or two bathrooms. If you select only one bathroom, input parameters associated with the second bathroom are grayed out on the screen and later screens. Changing this parameter resets all the other fields on the screen and all the fields on the next two screens as well. For each bathroom, you can also specify whether the shower is part of the bathtub or whether the bathroom has a separate bathtub and shower stall. Changes to the shower and bathtub layout settings cause automatic changes to the bathroom volume parameters that appear later on the screen. So be careful when you're updating these entries. In general, it's best to proceed in order through the model screens and parameter settings to avoid accidentally overriding any changes you made to parameters on later screens. You also have the option of specifying the location of the clothes washer. It defaults to being in the main house, but you can put it in either bathroom as well. If you put it in a bathroom, the program increases the bathroom volume from the default values to account for the extra space needed for the clothes washer. Next is the exhaust fan location. You have the option of putting each exhaust fan in either the shower or the bathroom. However, this parameter only does something if you set the exhaust fans to being on when the bathrooms are occupied on the previous screen. If you kept the default entry of off, this parameter doesn't change anything because the fans were always off. At the bottom of the screen are options to change the volumes of the different compartments and their air exchange rates. If you choose to change any of the parameters from their defaults, click on the information icons next to, next to each one to confirm how they work. The total house volume represents the volume of the entire house, including bathrooms number one and number two. Similarly, the total bathroom volumes represent the volume of each bathroom, including the shower compartment. If you don't know the volume of the compartments in your scenario, but have information on their area and height, you can click the calculator next to each entry to enter in the information and calculate their volumes. I'll click the calculator for bathroom number one's volume so you can see what it looks like. In the calculator, you have the option of entering dimensions in either metric or imperial units. So suppose, for example, that we know bathroom number one is 12 feet long by eight feet wide and has a height of eight feet. Entering that information into the calculator dialog box produces a volume of 21.7 cubic meters. I'm going to click the save button to store this new volume for use in our analysis. Clicking the calculator for the air exchange rates works similarly. In this case, you have the option of entering an air residence time in minutes for the air in each compartment. The program will use that information to generate an air exchange rate in units of air changes per hour. For example, if we enter an air residence time of 60 minutes, that yields one air change per hour. We can save this value by clicking the save button as well. If you're interested in how the model uses air exchange rates, you can find more information about them in the shower model technical document on the FAST resources page. You'll notice that after we change the volume and air exchange rates for bathroom number one, the reset to default values button at the bottom of the screen activated. Clicking this button will reset the values on this screen to the standard values associated with the scenario you selected and it will also reset the, the fields on the next two screens. One final feature on the screen is the View Household Layout link located at the top right. If you click this link, you'll see a schematic that reflects the layout options you selected on this screen. The layout image will show you the layout of compartments in the house and the location of each compliance considered within the model. In our example, you can see that each shower is together with the bathtub rather than in a separate shower stall, and that the clothes washer is in the main house, and that the exhaust fans are located in each bathroom rather than in the showers. Note that the image is not to scale, so that it won't reflect any changes you made to the compartment volumes. To close the house layout image, click the X in the upper right corner. 
When you're satisfied with the house information parameters you selected, click the next button to proceed to the appliance parameters screen. The appliance parameters screen allows you to customize the appliance parameter values in your scenario. Default values are already selected from information entered on the household scenario screen. You can use the scroll bar at the right of the screen to navigate downward. If you scroll down to the clothes washer parameter section, you'll see that the clothes washer location parameter is inactive. This parameter, along with the exhaust fan and bathtub location parameters you'll find farther down, is always inactive on this screen. These parameters are set on the previous house information screen, which you looked at earlier. You'll see that each standard scenario in the shower model assumes one dishwasher use and one clothes washer use per day. You can add additional dishwasher or clothes washer uses by clicking the add additional start times button in each section. The program allows up to five start times per appliance and the model will automatically check the start times and appliance durations for conflicts and will indicate an error if a conflict is detected. For example, let's try adding a second clothes washer use at 8 p.m. When we add a second clothes washer run at 8 p.m., we get an error message because the clothes washer cycle duration is 75 minutes. And a second start time of 8 p.m. doesn't give enough time for the previous cycle at 7 p.m. to finish. We can resolve the error by changing the cycle duration or by selecting a new start time. Let's, let's fix this example by changing the start time of the second clothes washer use to 9 p.m. If you scroll down through the remaining parameters, you'll find input parameters for the bathroom appliances and the shower appliances. If you change any of these parameters, you can use the reset to default values button to restore them to their original values without affecting parameter values on other screens. When you're satisfied with all the parameters you entered, click the next button to proceed to the activity patterns screen. The activity pattern screen allows you to define custom activity parameters for each person in the house. In the shower model, activity patterns refer to a description of where people are in the house throughout the day and when they're bathing. You can click on the view activity pattern link in the top right corner of the screen to view a diagram that shows each person's activity pattern according to the current parameter settings selected on the screen. The activity pattern visualization tool uses color blocks and letter symbols to identify where each person is throughout the day. Hovering the mouse over a color block in the tool opens a pop-up window with the specific start and end times of each activity. For example, hovering the mouse over the green S1 block for person one shows that person one is in the shower compartment from 6.35 a.m. to 6.42 a.m. You can scroll up and down in the dialog window to see other activities for each person throughout the day. For example, scrolling down, you can see that each person has an additional bathroom visit around 10 a.m. Clicking the X in the upper right corner of the tool closes the window. So back on the activity pattern screen, default activity patterns and values are already programmed, programmed into the screen using information entered on the household scenarios screen and on the house information screen. The shower model generates activity patterns for each person in the house using the parameters shown on the screen. It doesn't let you control every parameter related to the activity and patterns because that would be too complicated, but it does let you specify details about each person's main bathing activities along with a few other parameters. In the first table, you can use the activity type and compartment dropdowns to specify whether each person takes a shower or a tub bath in the morning or the evening. Everyone in the house must have either a morning or evening bathing activity scheduled for the simulation to proceed. For houses with two bathrooms, the drop downs also let you specify whether the person is bathing in bathroom number one or bathroom number two. Let's add an evening tub bath in bathroom number two for person number one by clicking on drop down and here selecting the tub bath shower number two option. After adding the evening tub bath, we can delete the morning shower for person one by opening the drop down and clicking the blank space. You'll notice that the activity duration and time and bathroom after activity fields filled in automatically after we selected the activity type and compartment location for the evening activity for person number one. 
You can change these fields to any whole number greater than zero, but if you type in a decimal number, you'll get an error. For tub baths, you can also assign someone else in the house to help with the tub bath. This option is good for simulating houses with young children or seniors who are unable to bathe themselves. For this example, let's assume that person two is a caregiver for person one and that they help them with their bath. I'll select person two and the person helping with tub bath drop down to assign them to help. Scrolling down, you'll find a drop down menu where you can select the target person in your scenario. The program defaults to identifying the most highly exposed person in the scenario, but if for whatever reason you wanted to know the exposure for a specific person, you can identify them using this drop down. For example, if we wanted to see the exposure specifically for the person taking a tub bath in our scenario, we could select person one. Or if we wanted to see the exposures for the caregiver helping them, we could select person two. Let's leave it on the most highly exposed person for now, though. The next three items on this screen all feed into the procedural activity pattern generator. The time between bathroom stays and the next shower or tub bath parameter defines the amount of time between one person exiting the bathroom after the shower or bath and the next person entering the same bathroom for their shower or bath. The program uses the same number for all people. The bathroom visits separate from the shower or tub bath parameter specifies how many additional bathroom visits each person makes throughout the day. This parameter only controls the number of additional visits. The program doesn't let you specify when each visit happens, but it does let you choose how many additional visits occur up to a maximum of five. The kitchen sink uses parameter specifies the number of times each person uses the kitchen sink during the day. You can enter any integer value from zero to 30. And the program averages out these uses during the time that people are home each day. So changes to this parameter don't affect the activity pattern you'll see for each person in the visualization tool. Continuing downward, the next set of parameters are the activity end times and the activity start times. The shower model generates activity patterns for each person by working backward from an established end time for the morning and evening bathing activities. These end times are set here with separate end times assigned for activities in bathroom number one and bathroom number two. The program requires a morning or evening end time for each bathroom in which a shower or bath is scheduled. In our example, there are morning activity end times listed for bathrooms number one and number two, and an evening activity end time listed for bathroom number two because of person one taking a tub back there. The program provides activity start times beneath the activity end times for reference. In our example, person one is taking a tub bath in the evening in bathroom number two, and no one else uses the bathroom in the evening. Person one takes a 20 minute tub bath and is in the bathroom for five minutes afterwards for a total of 25 minutes. So if the activity end time in bathroom number two is 7.53 p.m., 25 minutes earlier is 7.28 p.m. The end time of 7.53 p.m. is a standard value that loads for evening activities in bathroom number two the scenario, but you can change it to another end time, such as 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. if you want to. The final options on the activity pattern screen identify whether each person in the scenario is home all day or if they're away from home. Let's say in our scenario that person three and person four are away from home. We can mark them as away from home by clicking the away from home radio button next to their person numbers. When you select someone as away from home, the program activates the away from home start and end time fields. The program uses these the, the program uses the same away from home time for anyone that you mark as away from home with the radio buttons in this section. The time when people leave the house has to occur in the morning and the time when they return has to occur in the afternoon or evening. The program defaults to an away from home start time of 8 a.m. and an away from home end time of 6 p.m. But you can change those times so long as they don't conflict with the start and end times of the other activities. For example, let's say we tried to change the away from home start time to 7 a.m. In this case, we receive an error message saying that the away from home start time conflicts with the activity start and end times. The morning activity end times for bathroom one and bathroom two were both after 7 a.m. So setting the away from home start time to 7 a.m. Doesn't, doesn't work because person one or two are doing an activity such as taking a shower or bath. 
if we change the away from home start time to 7.30 a.m., the error goes away because the morning showers or baths in both bathrooms are done before 7.30 a.m. Other situations also can result in errors when setting up your activity patterns, so pay close attention to the text and any error messages when they appear. A very common error is that a person is doing an activity in the house, such as a shower or a bath, when a radial button has been selected that puts them away from home. So keep an eye out for that situation in particular. After you've looked over all the parameters and are satisfied with the data you've entered, it's time to run your scenario. I'll click the Run Custom Scenario button to run the scenario with the custom parameters we entered. The information provided in the custom scenario report is similar to the information in the default report, except that the custom report doesn't include tables S1 through S4. All the other tables and figures we looked at in the default report are here, though, so I'll only highlight a few other things that are different in this report. At the top of the screen, you'll see that it says that this is a custom seven-person household report. It identifies this report as a seven-morning shower scenario, even though we replaced the morning shower for person one with an evening tub bath. The seven morning showers comes from the name of the standard scenario we selected back on the household scenario screen, so it won't change to reflect any parameter values you made on subsequent screens. One thing you'll notice in the custom report is that some of the text is highlighted in red. If you changed any of the standard parameters for the scenario, you'll see the household scenario described as a modified custom scenario in the model input parameters table. And throughout the report, any parameter tables, any parameters that changed as a result of modifications you made to the scenario will be highlighted in bold red text. We'll see more of these as we scroll through the report. Scrolling down, you'll see that the custom reports don't have tables S1 to S4 from the default reports. The first table that shows up in the custom report is table one, and it gives the same type of information as table one in the default report. Here you see the average daily exposure concentration for all seven people in this scenario, along with their main bathing activities and an X identifying person seven as the most highly exposed person. Table two gives the average daily inhalation and dermal doses for the target person, which again is person seven in this scenario. Table three and table four show the amount of time the target person spends in different locations throughout the house and gives information about their exposure in each location. So here's table four. Figure one shows the contaminant concentration in each compartment. Because the house in this scenario has two bathrooms instead of just one, we now have five lines instead of just the three that we had in the default scenario report. Figure two shows the concentrations that the target person was exposed to throughout the day. If we keep scrolling, you'll see the references section in the model, model parameters section. Any parameters that were modified from the scenario standard parameters will appear in red. For example, here in table seven, you can see the changes we made to the total bathroom number one volume and the bathroom number one air exchange rate. Continuing on, tables eight through 11 are the same as those in the default report, so we won't spend time looking at them. The only new tables in the custom report are at the very end. Table 12 lists the activity pattern for each person in the scenario and is divided into separate subtables one for each person in the house. You can see here that the table for person one is almost entirely red. Person one's activity pattern changed because we updated their main activity from a morning shower in shower number one to an evening tub bath in shower number two. Changes for other people in the house were less extensive, so you won't see as much red in their tables. The last item in the custom report is figure three. It shows the human activity pattern for your scenario generated from the activity pattern visualization tool. It's the same image generated by the view activity pattern link on the activity pattern screen, but it's a static image in the report, so you can't hover over it for additional information. So 
So at this point, we've reached the end of the custom report, and that's everything we had to show you today for this training. So remember that next month, we'll hold a follow-up training about how to import results from the shower model into FAST for further analysis, so plan on making it to that one as well. So at this point, I'd like to open up the floor to see if there's any questions on the shower model or on anything we discussed today. Well, this is David. We've been getting some questions in the chat and I've been answering them along the way. Um, would you go back to the uh, chemical entry page? Yes. There were some questions about, yeah, if you add a chemical, what fields are required? And I, I looked at it and the only one that's really required is the molecular weight. So if you would start entering information there, let's look at when the save button turns blue. Yeah, so the information required, it will depend on whether you wanna run inhalation or dermal or both. Yep. The program requires a chemical name field, a cast number, most enter dummy data for now, and a molecular weight. If you want to run an inhalation scenario, you'll need to enter at least one inhalation parameter and ensure that the Henry's law constant is non-zero. The Henry's law constant reflected here is a default value, um, but you would change that to a real number. To run a dermal scenario, you would need to enter all three of these parameters. So the dermal permeability coefficient, the fraction absorbed through the skin, and the fraction absorbed in the DI tract. And a lot of those dermal parameters come from EPA's RSL tables. We go there first to find these dermal parameters. And someone wanted to know what an F value was. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the F value, the term F, value is short for fractional release value, and it represents the fraction of a contaminant that'll be released from water into the air as the contaminant runs through an appliance. The reason that the each chemical has a different F value for each appliance is that the numbers are appliance specific, so a different amount of contaminant will be released from a shower, for example, than from a bathroom sink, a bathtub, or a toilet. So let's actually look at the values for PCE. So you can see here the ones for tetrachloroethylene. In this case, the shower F value is 0.4366 or about 0.43. And so what that's saying is that when water passes through a shower, essentially 43% of the contaminant mass will be released from the water into the air if the air isn't saturated at all, at all with the contaminant. As the air gets more and more saturated with the contaminant, the release rate will decrease until eventually if the air is fully saturated, it'll go down to zero. But when no contaminant is already present in the air, the F value determines what fraction of the contaminant mass will be released and get into the air. And for, for showering, I'll add that most VOCs have F values of 0.4 to 0.6. And then semi VOCs the F values for showers are probably gonna be around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0.3. And the, the amount of chemical that volatilizes is a, it's a function of the Henry law constant and the diffusivity of the chemical in water and air. So, Zach, can you open up the Q&A part? Let people ask questions if they have questions. Oh, sure. We have, uh, people have been asking questions in the chat box. Yeah, I've been answering them. Oh, okay. Would you oh. like me to? Oh, there it is. Okay, wait, I saw one more question come in. Can you tell us again where to get the shower download? 
I recently had my work computer replaced and I need to reinstall it. So you can send an email to showermodel at cdc.gov and I'll send you the link and with instructions on how to download it. So you send an email to, here I'll type it in the chat box. And that seems to be the last open question in the chat box at yeah. this time. Are there any other questions? If anybody has any, now would be the time to enter them into the chat box. I'll give it just a moment, to see if anyone has any additional questions. I'm not seeing any more questions come in. And given that it is 1.33, should we um, wrap up? Yeah, so if you have questions while you're running the model, please, please contact us at showermodel.cdc.gov and I or Will will get with you to help you answer your questions. Uh, if you're using the, the shower model, um, I'd be happy to hear from you to find out what your experiences are if you have suggestions for improving it. We are, we are working on another version of the shower model. It will look at um, exposures that it occur at school settings, like with gyms, and then occupational exposures. So, we hope that to, that version, the next version to come out in 2023. So thanks everyone for, for dialing in. Have a good day. Thank you everyone.